Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to this week's or this month's uh, monthly webinar with, with me, Michael Houston, and my colleague Colin Szczynski, where hopefully Colin will be joining us later. He's having a few technical problems. Um, otherwise, it'll just be me. And we're going to start looking at the Philly Fed. If this is bad, and it's not bad actually, 8.3, better than expected, um, slightly flies in the face of the very poor empire manufacturing number that we saw earlier this week. And as a result, as it's a positive dollar number, we've got a little bit of a push higher in the dollar yen. July existing home sales have risen 2%. We were expecting a decline of 1.1%. So again, slightly dollar positive. Um, but again, we can see that the the result is fairly short-lived. Right, so now that we've done that, I can quickly take you through the disclaimer, which I'm bound to do for compliance and legal reasons. So if you could just basically uh, cast your eyes over that and um, uh, generally, in, generally uh, take that in, um, I will quickly skip through them and then, then we'll try and, and move forward and hopefully Colin will be able to join us later. Notwithstanding the fact that Jolly, Colin actually can't get into the webinar at the moment, uh, we were going to be talking about, obviously, last night's FOMC minutes, the fact that uh, they were, how should we say, slightly less hawkish than was expected. Um, everyone had made uh, great, um, had placed great emphasis on the fact that uh, the Federal Reserve in the Federal Reserve statement, um, the word more had been placed in front of the improvement in the labor markets. But what they didn't focus on was the fact that the paragraph which related to the stabilization in energy prices had been removed in the July statement. And it was in the April statement, which suggested to me that the Federal Reserve were more concerned about inflation than they were actually letting on. And that does appear to have turned out to be the case, because if we look at um, what, the, what the minutes said, um, the Fed said they had concerns not only about the low rate of inflation, they also had concerns about the strength of the US dollar and events in China. And that was on July the 29th. Since then, obviously, we've had the Chinese revaluation of the renminbi. We've also had an additional decline in crude oil prices and um, a whole host of other asset commodity prices have come quite significantly lower. So what does that mean for expectations about a Fed rate rise? Well, regular, regular viewers of these or listeners of these webinars will already know that I don't think the Fed is going to raise rates in September and have felt that way pretty much for the last six months. These minutes basically just reinforce that narrative for me, and it's certainly being reflected in some of the currency pairs that we're seeing um, See, seeing some of the dollar weaknesses that we're seeing play out at the moment. Unfortunately, we're not seeing anything significant in terms of breakouts, but I think this is significantly important. What we've had here is this Chinese revaluation has thrown into stark relief what or how closely correlated the euro and the Chinese renminbi have been, because if we look at euro dollar, and we look at the euro renminbi over the course of the last 18 to 20 months, the blue line is euro dollar, and the black line here is the Chinese renminbi against the euro. And we can see here that we've broken above the peaks that we saw in May and June with respect to the euro Chinese renminbi, which suggests that we're going to see further Chinese renminbi depreciation and euro strength. So what does that mean? It either means one, it can mean one of two things. It can either mean further dollar strength against the renminbi or further euro strength against the renminbi. And certainly the pullback that we saw in euro dollar over the past couple of days has reflected that. But we haven't been actually been able to close back below the previous resistance, which now acts as support. So what are, what, are we fa what are we faced with going forward? For, for me, this can mean one of two things. We can either see a significant rise in the dollar against the renminbi, 
doesn't seem likely. Or we can see a rise in the euro against the renminbi, which is probably more probable if you buy into the narrative that the Fed may not be able to raise rates in September, if the, even if, if they want to. And we're certainly seeing that played out in terms of dollar weakness with respect to the gold price. Um, if we look at the gold price, and we can see that from this chart here, this is, a save, this is one I saved earlier. This was the original breakout point lower that we saw from the October lows and the February-March lows earlier this year. What we've done now is we've actually managed to get back above this previous support level, which is now resistance. And if we can push on towards this trend line from the 2015 highs, we can certainly start to edge ever so slightly higher. Certainly looking at the gains of the last two days, we can certainly see that there's potential for further gold strength and further dollar weakness. What's worrying me a little bit about this particular chart is we're now starting to become a little bit overbought. So there is a concern that maybe we could run into a little bit of resistance around about 11.65, 11.70. And then, of course, you've got the 200-day moving average. So we're still in the gold downtrend. But certainly in terms of pairing expectations about a Fed rate hike, the expectations now, people are starting to pair back on their dollar long positions, their gold short positions, their euro short positions, their cable short positions, though the sterling dollar trade is slightly different in the context of the fact that the Bank of England is not expected to ease monetary, uh, monetary policy further, unlike the ECB, unlike the Bank of Japan. So the pound is going to get slightly more of a bid um, than, say, for example, the euro or the yen, simply because of the fact there is an expectation that the next move in monetary policy with respect to the Bank of England is likely to be a nudge upwards in interest rates as opposed to further easing. So. The, the, the cable trade or the cable trade dynamic does have a slightly different slant to it. If I was going to go short dollars and longer currency, I'd probably want to go long sterling as opposed to long euros. Be that as it may, the euro dollar at the moment continues to trade in this, this range that we've been in since April, May. And the bottom, the, the bottom of that range currently comes in around about 108.20. At the moment, we've got significant resistance at 112. The likelihood is that if we get a break above 112.20, and I can draw that line in through there, there, there it goes, fairly straightforward, 112.15, 112.16, we can see straight away that there's a significant area of resistance at that level. And if you're short Euro dollars, or if you're short Euro dollar, where would you put your stop loss? What you do is you put it above this, um, the, these, these, tw these two peaks here, the July peaks and so far the peaks this month. So 112.15, 112.20, bearing in mind we've got the 200-day moving average just above it. But certainly I think what would, could happen is if, if 112.25.30 gets dealt, then we could certainly get a move back to around about 113, 113, 40. And obviously the previous peaks that we saw in May, around about 114, 65. What I don't expect to see is a significant strong rebound in euro dollar, but I think there's a good chance we could well see 160 cable over the course of the next few weeks. Just have to wait and see how this particular trade plays out. If we drill down into the four hour chart, we can see once again, certainly through here, how this market has range traded over the course of the past month or so. Good selling interest at 112, 20, around about 112. Good buying interest around about 108, 108, 20. And a little bit of what I would call congestion um, in the 109, 80s, 110, 20 area suggesting that it could, get, it could go one way or the other. Now, while I'm, while I'm talking here, ladies and gents, what I would welcome, actually, if you have any questions about a particular currency pair or a particular product um, that you would like my view on, obviously I can't tell you where to buy and sell it. That just wouldn't do. And besides, I'd get into an awful lot of trouble with my compliance department, even if I did so. But um, that being said, I think 
you know, this 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 webinar is it's, it's about you it's just as much as it's about me talking to you about the markets. And I certainly think going forward, there's still going to be continued speculation about what the Federal Reserve might do going forward. What I would also say is that we also need to pay a significant amount of attention more than anything is to the fact we need to pay significant attention to next week's Jackson Hole Symposium, the annual symposium, central bank symposium, um, with respect to any, any sort of narrative that comes out of there with respect to what to expect about monetary policy in September. I don't think it's going to be significantly important simply because Janet Yellen, the Fed chief, is not going to be there. And if, if you factor that in, then maybe there's a good chance it could be a complete damp squib. So, but what, what I would say is that um, it's, certainly, it's certainly extremely important um, in the context of tone. And the fact of the matter is it's all about um, inflation, monetary policy and inflation dynamics, which is somewhat topical given the current debate and speculation about a Fed rate rise in September. So any questions, I'm just going to type in, need to be put over the chat facility. So if you just reply to any of the questions, any questions that you have from there. And then you can either ask me a question privately or you can basically throw it open to every everybody else. Um, so we'll move on to we'll move on to the pound against the dollar. I've identified the key resistance areas there. We can see with the four hour chart and the pound against the dollar here, we've got we've broken above the range highs that we've been in for quite some time earlier this week, but we haven't really been able to follow through with any significant momentum to the upside. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to carry on going higher in the short to medium term, but I certainly think there's a risk that we could come back here to around about 155.80. 155.80 is probably a um, fairly key, fairly, fairly important support level given that that was the initial launching pad for the rally that we saw on Tuesday in the wake of those slightly more robust inflation numbers, the core inflation numbers, the jumping core UK core inflation from 0.8% to 1.2. Um, I still think that despite that jump in UK inflation, the prospect of a rate hike in 2015 for the UK still remains a very much, very much an out outlying, an outside possibility, given given the weakness of given the weakness of the retail retail sales numbers that we saw this morning. They weren't necessarily bad, but they weren't particularly good either. But we were certainly expecting a much better performance from UK retail sales than what we actually got. If you factor out auto and fuel, we actually only saw a rise of 0.1% and we're expecting a rise of 0.4%. And, um, you know, a as such, um, f for me, I'm just going to – sorry, I'm in the process of trying to do something here. I'm being asked to promote Colin as a panelist because he's on as an attendee. And uh, I actually don't know how to do that, Colin. So, <laughs> um, that's going to be a bit of a bit of a problem. So what I would suggest you do, Colin, is uh, we'll, we'll give this one a miss and we'll try and find out why we, ha we had the problem and we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it later because what I don't want to do is start messing around with uh, the settings and run the risk of actually um, cutting, cutting you off or cutting everyone else off at the same time. Because so, actually, let me just, just let me just try it. Let's see what I can do. Now, where's it gone? Bear with me, ladies and gents, while I try and promote Colin to a panelist. I'm trying to do that now. And all right, I've done that, Colin. But I don't know whether um, I can't hear you. So 
I'm not sure how that's going to help me, or help you for that matter. So I've promoted you as a panellist. Now I guess you just need to do... Oh, here we go. Hang on. Hi, Michael. Hello. Can you hear me? I can. Loud and clear. Brilliant. Fantastic. Sorry, everyone, about this. Okay. We had, a, uh, we had a technical problem earlier with my login. I'm not sure why. I think the technical problem was you, mate. Anyway, <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's move on. So you've heard the conversation so far, Colin. Yes. Um, is there anything you want to expand upon uh, with respect to what we've already covered? Uh, no, no, let's just keep on going. Okay, right. So I've just been asked to run us through the FTSE 100 and the DAX. So yes. more than happy to do that. We'll start with the FTSE 100. Um, certainly, um, that is starting to look a little bit oversold. And, and I think there's a good chance that we're probably going to come back to the 6,300 level. What I want to see going forward is a move back above 6450 but while oil prices and commodity prices remain under pressure i think there's a definite chance that we're probably going to go back and revisit the december lows and those those series of lows around about the 6100 level now that may seem quite a long way away um but in the context of where we've come from if you look at what the FTSE 100 has done over the past say, for example, two or three years, let's just zoom the chart out, we're right on the 200-week moving average. So certainly I think from where we are at the moment, there is a, there is a prospect of a bit of a bounce back. Let's see what that value is. It's 6,347. Now, on the two occasions, on the few occasions that we have broken below it since 2012, we've gone and overshot it by about, in this case, the low there is 60, 70, by about 60 or 70 points on that particular week there. And then also 6125, 25 points through there. So I certainly think on, on the weekly chart, we're approaching a very, very key support level. Um, so in the short term, we can probably see a little bit more downside towards 6,300, which coincides pretty much with these lows that we saw in January. So a little bit more downside in the short term, but to stabilize, we need to get back above 64.50. Can um, you make the chart a little longer for a sec, Michael? In terms of Go daily, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like that. Is that okay. starting to look to me, if you look at the no, that late November high, the recent highs in the May, that double top back in April and May, that's almost starting to look like a head and shoulders to me. Or you mean, he, yeah, I see what you're saying there. So if, if we blow it out to, say, for example, a week. Yeah, there. You can see that. that we go all the way there. Okay. Right. Let's actually, let's at just. At the very push. least, it's a rounded top. That's not looking very good it, at all. It, it, it's not, but it's also very oversold on the oscillator and on, on, the, mm -hmm. on the stochastic. Let's open a secondary chart on that. Okay. So now I'm going to open a monthly chart. Actually, let's just keep that as a weekly. Let's do the real-time analysis here. Draw from the lows in 2009. Yeah, it's not quite there, is it? Let's draw it from the lows in 2012, 2011, rather. Let's get a shot of that. got to have a very sensitive, you've got to have a very uh, steady hand when you're drawing these in. Well, what this is telling me is that we are at a very, very key long-term support level. 200-week moving average and also very close to the lows that we saw in January, February, around about 63, 20, 63.30. So you could argue this is a rounded top. The only question I would have with respect to that is where is the where is the neckline? And I'm not sure. I mean, would you draw it through those lows there, Colin? Yeah, it's hard to say. In which case, you'd then have a slightly flatter line. And about there. Yeah, you could use that as a channel bottom for sure. And I've missed it. See, this is why you need a steady hand. So, go again. Click on that, 
and then go through there. I mean, basically what it's saying is there's certainly potential for more downside, but I would certainly be keeping an eye mm -hmm. on these current levels around about 63, 63.20, 63.30, and look for a bit of a rebound. Certainly if we look at the last two weeks, we've seen a significant decline. So we're due a bounce, I would suggest. We're, we're well overdue a bounce. question is, do we get one? Um, I certainly think there's scope for one at these sorts of levels. But what I, want to see, what I would want to see is a move back above 64.50 to suggest we get a bit of a rebound. So that's the FTSE. I think probably near a short-term base. But overall, the downtrend remains intact while we're below 64.50. Uh, moving on to the DAX, the DAX is still in pretty good shape for the year, but we have broken the 200-day moving average. And for those of you who saw my video during earlier on earlier this week, you'll know that I said that if we broke below the 200-day moving average, the potential for further losses was very, very high. And I certainly think in terms of the DAX, there's nothing now between 10,550 and 10,000. So we could go now the 450 points very, very easily in the DAX and not even really break a sweat because, let's face it, this is where we were at the beginning of this year, below 10,000, and we're still well above it. So we're still showing some fairly good gains for the DAX. We've broken the 200-day moving average, and we've broken it quite significantly, um, which would suggest to me that there's a significant amount of momentum behind that move can we get a short squeeze? Most definitely, yes, we can. But certainly this breakout here of this this very inelegant triangle, it's not the most elegant of triangles, I have to admit, would appear to suggest that there's plenty more downside if we measure this move here from the low in July to the high down from the breakout point here, which probably brings us to around about 10,100, give or take, the, all these peaks that we saw in December. So if we basically draw a horizontal line in with respect to the peaks in December, you're looking at about 10,100 as your next area of support in the DAX, because certainly if we look at between this line here and this line here, there's not really that much there in terms of actual support. And it's important that this, this, this 10,000 level was very, very important until we broke through it in the early part of this year. It was a big, big top. We had one, two, three, four, five goes at it before we got through it. Mm -hmm. So we can certainly test all the way back to it. Um, you know, the FTSE 100 is much more difficult to call because it's been pretty much trading sideways for the best, best part of two or three years. The DAX has gone on a parabolic move higher, got a little bit ahead of itself, so probably needs to come back a little bit, certainly to around about the 10,000 level before having a little bit of a rebound. Mm -hmm. Michael, Con on that, could we, um, before I have to jump, could we take a, a look and contrast this with gold? Sure. Yeah, I had a quick look at gold, um, but we can go back and look at that most definitely. I think it's That's quite interesting. What we're seeing now with the uh, the currency starting to really fall away, the, um, the the indices really starting to fall away. Like you look at the way the DAX that had an early drop in the spring was kind of drifting, and now it looks like the the bottom's getting ripped out from under it again. And interestingly mm -hmm. enough, gold is uh, is looking like it's it's finally starting to capitalize on some of this. All through the summer when we had all the uh, the Greek stuff going on, and gold didn't budge, and uh, and now we're starting to see this. And funny enough, now that Greece seems to be getting sorted out for now <laughs> always the for now with greece right but well, yeah because uh, there's elections i think i think suppress is rumored to have resigned or going to resign some point and call, anytime, call new elections yes so that could flare up any time and then they've got to have another go at their debt in, in the in the fall but uh, but certainly the way gold is uh, is starting to take off is uh, is quite something there it's uh, and we'll see what happens when it gets up closer to that downtrend line but uh, but between what's going on with China and the currencies and uh, and and Greece can come back around again and and it seems to finally all be starting to catch up to stocks. Mm. And yeah, of course I also we're think, going into the weak time of the year for stocks as well. Yeah, I also think you've got to factor in that we're probably going to get a bit more weakness in the Chinese currency, mm -hmm. which is going to compress or press down on the or inflation, 
going forward, and I think that is going to influence things. You know, if we look at the best performing emerging market currency last year or over the last 12 months, it's been the Chinese renminbi, and that can be certainly borne out by this chart that I've done overlaying the Chinese renminbi with dollar yen. So what we've got here, That's fascinating. Um, because the renminbi was pegged to the dollar, when the dollar went up, so did the renminbi, and it had a chilling effect on Chinese exports. What we've got now is dollar yen has basically continued to do nothing, but the renminbi has weakened quite significantly. The Chinese currency has weakened quite significantly. And I would expect, for this, if this correlation continues, for this to suddenly drop. So that feeds into my no rate hike um, narrative. I think dollar yen could well drop very, very sharply to the previous lows that we saw in July as it becomes slowly apparent the Fed's not going to raise in September and we could get a catch up here. We've certainly got a significant lag in dollar yen and as opposed to China. Too. Exactly, in Chinese yen. So you've got the, the bottom of that double top is at 120 and a half. If you compare that to what I was showing earlier with the euro and the rim NIMBY, it's a similar sort of story. The only difference is I'm going to just do two charts here. You look at these two, this is the euro against the Chinese rim NIMBY. Okay, so if I draw that, we broke out of that when we got the devaluation. We've come back and retested it, and now we're looking to go higher again. So as I was saying earlier, that can play itself out in one of two ways. This is 2014. The euro Chinese rim NIMBY has broken higher. Euro dollar hasn't. So I would expect one or two things to happen. Either the dollar appreciates against the rim NIMBY, or the euro shoots higher and the dollar weakens. One of them is going to drive this move, and I have a feeling it's probably going to be a weaker dollar. Could be wrong. Yeah, we'll see what happens, but I, I've been leaning towards that, uh, that we might get a dissent or two in September, but it's really getting hard to see how they're going to raise interest rates when everything else is crashing the other way. Exactly, and if we look at dollar CAD, this is something I wanted to show you guys earlier. Look at this dollar CAD chart. This is a four-hour chart. Um, we look as if we're building a top in dollar CAD. Um, if we look at the previous highs early this month, around about 132, irrespective of what you think about oil prices and further weakness, that certainly weighed on the Canadian dollar. But whether they're $40 or $35 or $30, if the Fed doesn't raise rates, do you think the Canada or the weaker oil price or the weaker dollar, which, will, which way will the dollar CAD go? given where we are at the moment. It looks to me like there's still room for the dollar, for the CAD to strengthen from here. I think that the, um, I, I still think with, with oil back at 40, I mean, I think we've got the 08 low near 35, but I think most of the decline we've seen from 60 to 40 is probably getting behind us now. So if crude oil can stabilize in this 35 to 40 range, there's room for uh, for dollar CAD to come back around if, if the if particularly and of course if the U.S. dollar weekend could also underpin commodity prices as well. Well, let's look at let's look at dollar CAD over the since since May June last year. Okay, it's quite an interesting chart, isn't it? You could almost be looking at a crude oil chart upside down. Yeah, absolutely. It's very similar. Oh, look at that. <laughs> So that's dollar CAD, a little sideways consolidation between February and April. Oh look, April and May, a slight lag on it. We've got a little bit of a down move on WTI, and certainly there's potential for us to go an awful lot lower. Um, we need to get back above WTI, $42 a barrel, I think, certainly in the case of this move here. I mean, you look at where we've come from since June. That was the June meeting of the Fed, okay, $60 a barrel. The July meeting was here, $48 a barrel. The minutes, $40 a barrel. Is that going to hike, Colin? Oh, sorry, I've got to jump, Michael. Okay. All right, mate. Uh, well, I'll talk Thanks, to you everyone. Soon. And okay. sorry, about the, uh, sorry about the delay this morning. No worries. Great. Bye-bye. So, so we are looking a little bit oversold on crude oil. $40 a barrel will probably act as a little bit of support on the downside simply because it's a round number 
and generally markets tend to be a little bit superstitious when it comes to round numbers. There's always you always tend to get a little bit of what I would call um, a little bit of aggregation of orders around a very very key level. So if you're long crude oil, you're going to put you're going to put buy orders around about. 40.10, 40.20, and stop losses around about 39.80 or 39.90. So certainly looking, certainly looking at crude oil there, there is potential for a little bit of a bounce. But overall, unless we get back above these three peaks here, one, two, three, which is the peaks of Tuesday and Monday and Tuesday of this week, which is round about $43 a barrel then the direction of travel does suggest that we can go an awful lot lower. Now, it is oversold, but it's been oversold since July. So certainly there's potential for us to carry on going lower and this just to stay exactly where it is. Go to a weekly chart. It's also quite important in the context of the fact that we've broken below the previous lows here. And if we change this to a monthly chart, we can see straight away that really the next support is around about the 2008 lows, which is around about $35 a barrel. So this is just the last two months. That's July, the decline in oil. That's August. I mean, that monthly chart is absolutely eye-wateringly um, significant in the context of what could happen to inflation over the course of the next few months. There's a significant lag. Of, there's a significant lag effect involved in um, in basically um, price pressures filtering down and filtering through. So I certainly think in that context we can certainly expect um, the Fed to stay on hold and monetary policy to stay fairly loose. Right. So covered crude oil. Covered um, Brent. Brent's Brent's going to probably be a similar sort of story with respect to that. Is there anything else that you'd like me to cover, ladies and gents, before um, before before we sign this off? Well, we haven't actually looked at um, U.S. stocks, so I'll, I'll do that. And we can see that we've been in a range on the S&P 500 for the past few months, certainly since March. Certainly found quite a few lows around about 2035, 2040. Declines of the last two days would seem to suggest the momentum is building up for a move lower. But really, I think the key level here is 2040, as well as support from the trend line lows from the December lows here. But also, if we take it all the way out, we can see that um, we're also approaching a very key support line from the lows that we saw in 2011. But again, you could argue this is also a little bit of what we could potentially be a rounded top. So you can see straight away through here, through 2015, how important this 2035, 2040 area is in the context of the long-term trend. One thing that does worry me about the S&P 500 and U.S. markets in general is that for the past two to three months, the small cap index has actually shown a significant amount of more weakness than the actual benchmarks itself, the main benchmarks. And we can see that played out here. We are starting to break lower on the overall benchmarks on the small cap 2000 or the Russell 2000 and approaching a very, very key long-term support level here. So keep an eye on this particular chart here because if we bounce off this, then we could well see a rebound in broader U.S. markets if we get down to these sorts of lows here, which also coincides with the 2015 lows that we saw in early in early in, in early January, which was round about this low here, which is around about 11.43, which is around about 43 points below where we are now. Dow Jones, US 30, similar sort of story approaching a very key support level here, 17,038. So again, got a key support level. It's worth keeping an eye on on a daily chart. Certainly look at, we've also posted a little bit of a, a negative death cross on the, on, the, on the US 30. Not that much of an issue, but we can also see how important this 17,000 level is in the context 
of these lows that we saw at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. So we can see that U.S. markets are also approaching some very key support levels in the short to medium term. But when you actually look at where they've come from, you know, people are obsessing about the fact that markets have fallen quite sharply in the past few weeks. Look at it through the prism of the last few years, and you'll see that the, sh the falls that we've seen thus far are probably fairly minor in the, in, the, in the broader scheme of things. And I think that's important to put that into perspective as well. Um, let's have a quick look at the Aussie dollar. It's always a bit of a bit of an old favourite. And this chart's starting to look a, a little bit heavy. Certainly has been looking heavy for quite some time now. Finding a little bit of support just above 72 cents. can draw that chart, that, that line in there. 72.30. Let's bring the chart all the way out. Why did I draw that line in there? Yep, 2008 lows is around about 60, and then we've got these peaks here from the um, peaks at the end of 2008, which currently come in around about 71.40. So again, the Aussie dollar is starting to approach um, significantly important support levels. So when you look at the dollar CAD commodity currency, you look at the Aussie dollar commodity currency, I think as long as we stay above the support level around about 72.30, the resistance level on dollar CAD at 132, I think there is some scope for a little bit of dollar weakness. Right. Any questions on anything that we've covered so far? Is there anything that you would like to ask me with respect to other markets. You can have a look at the Hong Kong 8 shares. That's looking a little bit ugly, which suggests that potentially we could see further declines there. Again, you know, we have to keep an eye on some very, very key support levels. We've broken below one on the 8 shares. And certainly, given the direction of travel of the market thus far, we could well come back and revisit these lows here around about 10,000. We've broken below the lows of the, that we saw in July by quite some distance. And this is the offshore market that we're looking at here. This is not the Shanghai market. This is the Hong Kong China 8 shares index, which I think essentially um, gives you a broader indication of sentiment with respect to China and its stock market than the onshore market, which is very much manipulated by or has, is greater more influenced by um, the Chinese central bank. Chinese central bank can't manipulate anywhere near as easily the Hong Kong markets as it can the Shanghai markets. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions over and above what we've already talked about? Just putting it out there with this uh, question. Okay, I'm guessing that no one has any questions. I'm going to be posting this on YouTube in the next 24 hours. So if you want to listen to it, if you want to listen to it back, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for attending and um, good luck, um, good luck with your trading. And I will speak to you all again on the non-farm payrolls webinar in September, or my colleague Jasper hosts a webinar every Monday at 12.15 which you can sign up for from the education section on the CMC Markets website. Okay, well, I think we're all done. So thank you very much for listening, ladies and gents, and uh, have a good week. <laughs>